you so much. It's a beautiful reading. Um, before we start today's talk, um, I would love to read with a praise to Parashra, <laughs> Prajna Paramita. Um, and we'll wait for that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we can say this um, together. Beyond words, beyond thought, beyond description, prajna paramita, unborn, unceasing, the very essence of space, that it can be experienced as the wisdom of our own awareness, homage to the mother of the Buddha's past, present, and future. Thank you for coming out, and happy Father's Day. My talk is on the Heart Sutra, so I love beautiful reading. It's so great to have it read and read slowly, which is how it's supposed to be read. Um, so this talk falls under the category of it seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> You, you know, you see Lama, you're having a nice darshan, and uh, you mention liking a verse, and the next thing you know, you walk out within an assignment. And so what follows for the next few months in my head looks like, you know, Edvard Munch's The Scream. Uh, it doesn't help also when people close to you kind of gasp and say, you're talking about what? <laughs> yeah, nevertheless, she persisted. So um, before we start, a couple of resources that I consulted heavily um, in order of appearance. An Arrow to the Heart by Ken McLeod. This is a beautiful entree into the piece. Um, it's uh, verse itself. And uh, so it's very accessible. <clears throat> and pithy. And then <clears throat> Red Pines, the Heart Sutra. Um, a little bit denser, but also very readable. That's what I love about all of these books. And excuse me, <clears throat> they came all, all of these were kind of recommendations. And then Thich Nhat Hans, The Other Shore. <laughs> like you could sit down and read it in a night. It is so extraordinary, beautifully written, clear, lucid, just masterful. It's, it's just Zen masterpiece. So it's like Zen. But I also consulted Lama Jimpa, uh, who I consider to be the guru hidden in plain sight. I often talk about the Heart Sutra being hidden in plain sight, this really incredible gem. And so is our teacher, who's a gem. Um, <clears throat> I listened to the four, four part talk given by Alexander Burzen on the Heart Sutra, um, as well as um, there's a great introduction to the by Carl Brunhosel. I'm sorry if I'm butchering people's names, um, called the Heart Attack Sutra. I haven't made my way all the way through the book, but but the intro has been republished in Tricycle and also Lion's Roar, so you can find that online. And then the Dalai Lama had a three-day talk on the Heart Sutra, which was very dense. So there were many other things resource consulted, but those are those would be the top ones. Um, so you might ask, like, why the Heart Sutra? Like many of us here, um, I've recited it for years. And then one day sitting here, there was a soft shift. And I can't explain it really, but it, I just started to notice little things about it. The sound of the words, a phrase, a pattern. And these little things continued to grow over time um, until I thought, you know, it's weird. Like, I've never really seen this. It was hidden in plain sight. It had a siren quality to it, calling me, but the more I tried to grab hold of it, the more it slipped away. And that, by the way, doesn't change at all after this talk. It is still as elusive as ever. But what's elusive about it? Well, first off, who's telling the story? We start with an unidentified narrator who says, thus did I hear it one time. 
but we have an arhat who asks questions, or is it the Buddha who's asking a question through him? What follows is a response, a, a kind of a monologue. It's a dialogue, but it's kind of get delivered in this one part as a monologue. And it ends with everyone praising the words spoken by the Buddha, so it's all over the place. So in between, we have a take no hostages bodhisattva who's swinging a verbal sledgehammer and saying no to everything and all the ways that we know the world, no eye, no, near, no ear, no nose. Brunhozel says, we can safely say about the Heart Sutra that it's completely crazy. <laughs> he says that it's a sutra about crazy wisdom, that it demolishes our usual con conceptual framework, our rigid ideas and belief systems, and all of our reference points, including any we had about our spiritual path. This crazy wisdom, you could come, this, this is crazy wisdom. And I would say to any of you who want to come into um, Lama's office sometime, <laughs> you can also experience crazy wisdom in real life. So today I thought I'd share what I've learned about the Heart Sutra, its power, its beauty, its wisdom, and elusiveness. And at the end, we can do formal question and answer, if that's your jam, or you could tell me what you like about the Heart Sutra, and what you get from it which I think would be a really more interesting conversation than asking me questions I have no answer to. <laughs> um, Rana Jumper reminded me that a close reading of any work of art, whether it's poetry or a talk or verse, should start with some context. So let's begin at the beginning, as they say. What's a sutra? Sutra comes from the Sanskrit, and it means thread or string, and it's similar in meaning to our word to sew or suture. Sutras are scripture, or sacred words that re and refer to the Buddha's teachings. These oral teachings, because writing wasn't common during his lifetime, were collected and sewn together, as it were, from a common theme that was passed down through generations. By the way, it's a long talk, so you have to just settle in, but I promise there are cupcakes at the end. <laughs> Sutra is a kind of term reserved for sermons of the Buddha or disciples empowered by him to speak on his behalf versus a shastra, which means investigation, and was typically used for scholastic texts like the Abhidhamma. More about that, just a tiny bit more later. Immediately following the Buddha's death, an assembly of monks gathered Immediately following Buddha's death, an assembly of monks gathered at the cave under Vulture's Peak in Rajagriha to recall and preserve the teachings. We're told that Ananda, the Buddha's cousin, had a perfect memory, and he recited all of the teachings from memory at this first council. It wasn't until well over 100 years after that the sutras and other teachings were recorded and arranged in Pali, that's the original language in which they had been memorized by monks in Sri Lanka, and sometime later in Sanskrit in India. Sutras are written in prose and verse and tend to follow a certain literary pattern, like starting with, thus did I, have I heard. They also tend to include a description of the circumstances that led the Buddha to give the teaching, and also notes the time, place, year, and so forth. So already the Heart Sutras, it's familiar, but also different. It's almost as if that intro, we've lost one already. So it's almost as if that intro were tacked on later, and um, there's some, some discussion about whether or not that's, that's what happened. Anyway, um, among later Sanskrit texts from the first century um, common era, scholars found a new type of text that declares itself the key teachings of the Buddha superior to what had earlier been considered the mainstream. Known in Sanskrit as the Prajna Paramitas, Paramita Sutra, the perfection of wisdom, this works the earliest known of its kind. So um, I'd like to take a minute to unpack the meaning of the word Heart Sutra, because that's what kind of came next. What's a sutra? And what's the Heart Sutra? In Sanskrit, the Heart Sutra is called the Bhagavati Prajnaparamita Hridaya Sutra, or the essence of the Blessed Mother, the heart of the transcendent perfection of wisdom. Unpacking this a little bit, because there's a lot going on. Prajna means wisdom, and the perfection of wisdom is known as Prajna Paramita, which then begs the question, what's a Paramita? 
The parameters are virtues or far-reaching attitudes that work together that help us realize our full potential. Typically, they're six in number, um, and they're states of mind that lead the way to liberation and enlightenment, such as generosity, ethical self-discipline, patience, perseverance, concentration or mental stability, as well as wisdom or discriminating awareness. By blending all of these together and bringing them into our daily lives, they enable us to do things like solve difficult problems, not yell at your daughter when she chips the car door, reduce or eliminate disturbing emotions, and be the best our best selves. I love you, baby. She's here. <laughs> These transcendent perfections are an essential concept in the practice of Mahayana Buddhism. Charlotte Rinpoche says, if we want to obtain enlightenment by becoming a bodhisattva, it's necessary to actualize wisdom and compassion. This is done by the practice of the six paramitas, or transcendental actions. Para in Sanskrit means the other shore. So here it means going beyond our own notion of self, beyond our conventional understanding of the self, and in that sense, our actions and attitudes are done in the non-egocentric way. Back to Prajnaparamita. It's not only the name of the teaching that formed the basis of Mahayana Buddhism, it's also the name of a deity who embodies the teaching and thus reality. We you saw um, a picture of her at the beginning. The Sanskrit means transcendent wisdom or perfection of wisdom. Pridaya can be translated into heart. It also means essence. So the heart is considered actually to mean the heart of the Prajnaparamita practice. And lastly, I'll say that the uh, Bhagavati um, comes from Agaba, meaning Buddha, but in this case, that little I at the end makes it feminine. So that's really interesting. I, I, I was very surprised by this. So Paramita is transcendent wisdom, the original non-dual, non-conceptual wisdom knowing the womb of enlightened beings or mother of Buddhas, Tathagatas. Since in the Prajnaparamita text, such as the Heart Sutra, Buddhas are born from the practice of Prajnaparamita, not Nirvana. So the Heart Sutra belongs to the Perfection of Wisdom Sutras, and it's one of about 40 texts focused on the doctrine of emptiness or shunyata. The longest is 100,000 verses, and the shortest is a single syllable, ah. It's the source of all speech, and it's used as a symbol for emptiness. The Heart Sutra is less than a single page, about 250 words, yet books have been written about it, and it's one of the best known and commonly recited sutras in the Buddhist canon. It's considered to summarize more of the Buddhist teaching, teachings in a shorter span than any other sutra. And yet, while it's recited weekly here and even daily in many monasteries in the world, it remains at heart a mystery. Beautiful, profound, a little crazy, and with a history that's hard to pin down. And this is the story within a story. The story of the sutra's discovery really depends on who you ask. On a straight-up sort of Western historical level, no one knows for certain where, where it came from or who recorded it. According to Red Pine, during the Tang Dynasty, a young monk named Xuanzang befriended a man who was sick and destitute. And this man repaid the boy's kindness by teaching him the Heart Sutra. Xuanzang would go on to travel from China to India along the Silk Road to bring back Buddhist scriptures and to find answers to questions concerning the Buddhist teachings that the world that we know is nothing but mind. He's responsible for translating many, many Buddhist scriptures, including the Heart Sutra in 649 Amanera. It's said that during perilous times, he turned to the Heart Sutra for protection. And this detail really stands out to me because the essence of the Heart Sutra is distilled into a mantra, a word that literally means mind protection. So we can say that the very essence of the Heart Sutra is the mantra, who is also a Prajnaparamita herself. All the Buddhas rely on and dwell in this mantra. Reciting it doesn't just evoke Prajnaparamita, it becomes her womb. But we'll leave that for another talk. It's clear that Xuan Zong felt the power of the sutra. Got back and leaned on it for help. 
There was impetus for his travels and it deepened the understanding of how things are for him. So let's take a look at the setting. If we're looking at any work of art, setting plays a significant role in grounding us in the story about what's happening or what's going to happen. Mama Jemper re recommended that I, I take a close look at this. So um, the scene unfolds at Vulture's Peak in Rajagriha, a place in central India that's as important in the life of the teachings of the Buddha as the Bodhi tree or Deer Park or was one of the Buddha Shakyamuni's favorite places to go on retreat, and where he gave many important teachings, such as the Lotus Sutra, as well as the Heart Sutra. It must be something to behold. The pictures are as astonishing. It's a mountain with rock formations that said to look like a vulture with wings to either side. And at the top was a beautiful panoramic view in caves in which Shariputra and Ananda lived and practiced, where the first Buddhist council was held after the Buddha's death. According to tradition, the historical Buddha delivered the Heart Sutra. It's literally rocks. It literally flocks. Well, I keep cutting out. There I go. But yeah, flocks like birds, like flocks of people. An assembly of 5,000 monks and nuns. Is it? Is it? Okay, thank you. All right. Okay, yeah. So he delivered the heart sutra to literally flocks, an assembly of 5,000 monks and nuns, as well as God <laughs> or supernatural beings, Gandharvas, divine musicians, singers, and so we're getting the sense that something different is at play here. First of all, deconstructing this a little bit, like um, the focus is on air, view, taking flight, birds, magic, spiritual symbols everywhere. And by the way, Gandharvas were often depicted as half human, half bird, and capable of flying. And then, of course, there are Maha, Maha Siddhas who are present, who had extraordinary powers and Okay. Okay. I'll be seeing later. Oh, okay. All right. This is fine. Oh, that's even better. Okay. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay, great. All right, I'll just be up close. Okay. Um, so uh, where did I stop? So, okay, so yeah, the Gandharvas, right? Half human, half bird. And then Mahasiddhas, who had extraordinary powers and could levitate and fly. So, when the Jimba said, it's like the whole universe is showing up. And this is really magical. Oh, wait, there's more. <laughs> At the same time that the Heart Sutra was being so-called delivered, which it wasn't, at least not in any traditional way, an emanation of the Buddha appeared at Dhanya Kataka Stupa in South India and taught the Kala Chakra, or the Wheel of Time doctrine, to the king of Shambhala. I'm just saying this is not your usual Sunday service. So what's happening from a plot point of view? The Buddha enters into a deep and profound samadhi. To be clear, this is an analytical meditation. It's a mystical, radiant, luminous, meditative absorption. If you can imagine meditating at the quantum level, where things come into being. Two of his closest students are seated nearby, Avalokiteshvara, the Bodhisattva, and cosmic being, a Mahasattva, and, the, and also the embodiment of compassion, and Shariputra, a human, albeit an arhat worthy one, who was known for his logic and deep intellect. Avalokiteshvara was looking at the true meaning of Prajnaparamita when, through the power of the Buddha, through the power of the Buddha, 
It was through the power of the Buddha that Shariputra was able to request a teaching of this great being. So Avalokiteshvara isn't even human. There's a Shariputra who is human. And the Buddha doesn't actually speak a word until the end of this. Still, the conversation is powered by or induced and blessed by the Buddha. And we can read this as some kind of revelatory or higher communication that's happening that makes it possible. And Shariputra asks, how should any son of the lineage train who wishes to practice the perception of wisdom, perfection of wisdom? Avalokiteshvara then basically says, not like you've been doing. <laughs> and he begins to dismantle everything we know about reality, starting with that famous line, form is emptiness, emptiness is form. How we see the world and how we re react to things, how we take in information, the truth of suffering, the 12 links of dependent origination, basically all of the teachings of the Buddha that came before, in the first turning of the wheel, falls away. When the Buddha comes out of his meditation and concurs and blesses the talk, it is like that. It is like that. One of the Thibdum children says, the Buddha is not praising Avalokiteshvara. He's telling everyone in the audience to listen to what he said because he spoke it right. So at this point, she continues, everyone present realized the whole dialogue was actually done under the inspiration of the Buddha, and in that way was spoken by the Buddha. So everyone rejoices at the end, right? In our sutra, yes, but in other sutras, not quite. Like according to Brunhosel, there are accounts in the larger Prajna Paramita sutras about people who were present in the audience who had a hard time with the talk. Some of them left, some couldn't handle it. And then those who couldn't handle it but stayed <laughs> had heart attacks, vomited blood, and died. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure the translator left off having a good day and <laughs> it's an inside joke for any of you who do administrative work at Lion Shore you've been warned um, so we can't wrap up this little um talk without saying a word or two about emptiness. Asking what is emptiness sounds a little like who's buried in Grant's tomb. The answer, by the way, is no one, you know, since Grant and his wife are entombed, not buried. But if you're new to all of this, or even if you're not like me, emptiness can seem so sad and depressing, like someone handed you an empty cupcake wrapper. Something totally great was there and got taken away. Maybe the crumbs are on Patty's sweater. Or on. <laughs> cupcake, no cupcake. Eternalism, nihilism. Just kidding. Thich Nhat Hanh tells us that emptiness isn't something to be afraid of. Emptiness doesn't mean nothingness. Emptiness means that something is empty of a separate self. And while it's empty of self, it's also full of everything else. In the book, uh, the other shore, he invites the reader to look at a sheet of paper, and instead of seeing something blank, to see the cloud in the paper, he writes, but without the cloud, there will be no rain. Without rain, the trees can't grow, and without trees, we cannot make paper. The cloud isn't there, the sheet of paper can't be there either. And then there's also the sunshine and the logger and the people who know the paper, and ultimately, if we're able to look deeply enough, we can see that we're in it too. He writes, this is not difficult to see because when we look at a sheet of paper, the sheet of paper is part of our perception. Your mind is in here and my mind is also. So we can say that everything is in here in this sheet of paper. You can't point out one thing that is not here. Time, space, the earth, everything coexists with this sheet of paper. Thich Nhat Hanh uses the word interbeing and interbeing as a verb instead of emptiness because you can't just be by yourself alone. You have to interbe with everything else. Rama says this experience that you don't own anything, and that things don't own themselves, is an insightful experience. He says it's like going into the house with no owner. Ownership is a burden. No self is liberation. 
And this is also why Lamala calls the Heart Sutra radical, because it not only negates the central doct doctrines of Buddhism, it also blows up the whole idea of the individual person becoming enlightened. At the center of the Heart Sutra is a contrast between arhats and bodhisattvas. Arhats aspire to individual realization and haven't developed as much compassion or, or breadth of vision as bodhisattvas, who promote a different version of realization, one that goes beyond, one that's individually felt but not individually owned, like music or art or dance, it's shared. Thus, the Heart Sutra and Lion's Roar, our Sangha, all of us here today, our shared collective activity is not and cannot be about individual enlightenment, but the enlightened mandala. In closing, um, I'd like to read a poem by Ken McLeod from Arrow to the Heart. What's the big picture here? Two points of view. Things exist. Just follow the path from ignorance to awareness. Here, these maps will help. Nothing exists, not even ignorance or awareness, and there is no path. What use are your maps? Buddha supported just one of them. What happened to the middle way? What do you do? Chew on this until your teeth fall out. Anything less won't do. Thanks. It's now time for questions or what did you think about our Zutro? <laughs> Enjoy about it. Oh, right now. Oh, right now. Oh, okay. All right. Um. You know, we do um, recite the Heart Sutra like every week. And so it's so easy to just, you know, with my little, you know just to kind of space it out, right? And just kind of, blah, 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 blah. it's memorized, and da, 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 you know. Um, until you get to the mantra, for me, it's getting to the mantra. Then you stop because we do it a number of times. So I'm always kind of thrown off when I go to other um, sanghas and the mantra is only done once because I, that's where I stop is, is, is at the mantra because then the translation of that pushes the boundaries. Um, But I don't really ever think about, I mean, I'm just, I'm not, not intellectual enough to, to, to like think and contemplate emptiness and all of, you know, all, all of this stuff. It's just so magical. It's like, um, there's other sutras um, that, you know, we've read, um, or that I've read, and probably a lot of people here also have read. You know, the Mahayana Sutras are just full of all of this magical, crazy, incredible stuff. Um, and they just kind of wash over you in a, a um, cosmic way and open, 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 open everything. You know, um, and so it's that mantra that for me, going beyond, way beyond, way, way, way beyond, you know, just like there's no end to beyond. And that's, that's for me, kind of where the heart switch are, even if I'm just kind of wrote, blah, 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 you know, saying it, because it's memorized, I get to the mantra, and then I stop. And then, and then it just, it coalesces into something. Thank you. I don't... 
exactly in the, exactly the thing. You, you know, it's not something that we can right, grasp intellectually. It has to be there's sort of a, a deeper experience of it. And going to a getting out of our conceptual framework and um into a felt place, a deeper way of knowing, and where concept the dualistic sense of under our understanding of the world falls away and that things are solid and real on their own side and like you go to this other place that's very far away and from the and open and spacious and exactly yeah beautiful I say that like I experienced it I haven't <laughs> yeah We only have one mic. None of the other mics want to work. Like this. <laughs> yeah. It's the first one. Let me do a mic. Uh, going on a minute. Just the priest of mantras being the ultimate mantra that's beyond all other mantras. Does the mantra give you an experience, or does it point to the experience, or is it both? And sometimes it sounds like you don't have to repeat any other ones, but that, but it's obviously not. <laughs> yeah. So your question is: Is the does the mantra bring the understanding, or does the experience to it? I don't. You know, I I don't know. Maybe both. I don't I don't you know it's uh, I guess in one sense it points to it. I don't that I don't think it brings the experience of it of, on its own. Not I haven't had that experience yet. But maybe I haven't had either, have also not had that samadhi experience. So I don't, I'm not sure. But it's, it, it is interesting that it, it does seem to, there's a kind of um, magic about it. And there is a kind of um, transcendent experience that comes from repeating the mantra. So maybe it's just a matter of continuing to go back and. Yeah. Oh, yay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Since we, since you discussed um, at the start that you wanted us to share our experience of the Heart Sutra, I'll go ahead. And I remember like when I first started coming here and we had the prayer books and stuff. And like when I realized this was the prayer we had to do, I was like, oh my God, they're making us do this whole thing. It was just like the worst thing for so long. It was, it was like the longest, like most tedious part of coming. You know, I just, I have to be real with that. Um, and it's like after a couple of years of doing it, I actually really started liking it. It kind of took on this fairy tale quality, and now it's out of everything, it's my favorite thing to read because of just the magic that comes with with reading it. It's it's almost like this uh, like childhood nighttime story that you want to keep hearing over and over again. Where it's like, please, like, can we do it again? Can we do it again? Oh my God, yes, we're doing it again. Um, and I guess what I'm most curious about is like, um, what part, I guess, or you know, concept or portion of the reading inspired you most to do this talk? I, 
I think for me, it was where when Shari Putra, uh, uh, Avalokiteshvara just starts taking a sledgehammer to everything. <laughs> and I'm like, what the hell? <laughs> what is happening? It's mesmerizing. Know this, know that, no, no, no ears. What is that? No nose. How strange, you know. What? Yeah, <laughs> and it just and it goes from there, and uh, and and then I don't know. I so there was something about that giant negation, and it was so anti-Buddhist in a way. Like it's like, you know, it wasn't like um the nice Buddhists. <laughs> um it's pretty radical and um yeah so then i'm like hey it's something and literary it and anyway that drum beat kind of called to me and um i feel like i'm gonna go home and think of like 15 other things that i wanted to say about that thank you for asking yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Thank you, Jen. I didn't think that was long at all. That seemed to go by really quickly. And I really appreciated um, all your Buddhist philosophy puns. Yeah, especially on Father's Day, it was very perfect. <laughs> um, I I really like this sutra. Um, it's probably I don't have a lot of experience in sutra um, study, but um, this is this is my fave. Um, and I I remember my. So as far as my experience with it, I remember going to long as I was reading about how like people could meditate on emptiness and I didn't understand that. And, um, and I was like, well, how do you, how do you do that? How do you actually experience that? And he was like, well, have you read the Heart Sutra? <laughs> and I was like, and I was seriously like, because of like, you know, like how it is in the middle of a conversation with teacher. I was like, ah, I think so. And I was like, go around, like, which one is that? You know, like I'm pretty sure I've heard of that. Um, but, um, so, uh, after that, though, um, like, um, and you mentioned this line. So then I, I went and read it and I was like, Oh, it literally, like, like, like they, he, Sri Putra asked, right? Like, how should any son of the lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom? And then it just lays out how we can actually practice that in our daily life. Like how we correctly and repeatedly beholding all the five aggregates is also empty of inherent nature. And um, saying that, I feel like in some of the um, commentary, it's like the going back to the viewing everything as dreams, bubbles, lightning, clouds. So I don't know exactly how to do that either, but it seems like good effort. And I, I wonder if in that if in that practice, if it's had what effect it's had. Um, uh, yeah, I guess I wonder what the effect would be, like actually viewing everything as a dream and this lightning, this bubbles. Uh, uh, it can be, uh, what are those kind of questions that you ask and don't expect an answer? A rhetorical question.
what you how you open this because like there is there's nothing quite like like really like the home surgery and then going to Lama who then just like how do you explain this? How do you explain this? And I'm like, oh my God, I can't. I can't. You know, I, it's very it's it kind of cuts right through. But um, but then you go and you hours of Google and read books and you know, do a lot of that. So kind of getting up to speed. It's of course do not have an answer. I'm just was fascinated by it, looking into it. Um I love the idea of, for me, uh, the flipping the whole emptiness thing um, to be interdependent, intervening, radical interdependence, I think is what our teacher called it. And, and then, um, all right, I, I, mean, I got to tell you a story. So I met with Lama um, over at the cottage to talk about the Heart Sutra. Um, and I realized my complete unworthiness for this. But um, it was interesting because there were a lot of people in the cottage and I didn't really expect that. And I kind of expected one-on-one, -on -one, you know, we're gonna talk about the heart chakra. And um, so there was a musician there, there was a dancer there, there was a painter who was there. Um, and, and then, uh, and it was weird. And then he sat down and started talking about this thing about the enlightenment of love. And about how we don't, um, that really, okay, so we're part about like, Avalokiteshvara, who's the embodiment of compassion and not really a human being. And then you have Shariputra, who's sort of our representative human being, who's us, right? He, he was a deep scholar, um, wise, a very close student in Buddha, but he also was, you know, it was like, associated with this group called the Sarvastivadins, and they were the kind of, so it had to do with the Abhidharma and kind of, you know, this Buddhist psychology and how things come into be reality, right? It was very kind of, there are the little causes and conditions and that bring about situations. And so that's sort of like right there, emptiness in the, wearing the white trunks, emptiness over here. In the other corner is human beings who tend to concretize uh, our experience of reality and the bringing of this together anyway. So um, that you cannot just get enlightened for yourself only, and it doesn't happen if there is no self. There's no self to become enlightened. It's all of us. And as he was talking and all these people were there, I realized that it was like, I was in the Heart Sutra. It was a trip. I felt like I was in a dream. Not to be too California here, but it was interesting. I had, it was meta. <laughs> the latest book uh, was. Uh, was uh, Tupin, Tupin, who, Tupin Chogun and uh, the Dalai Lama. There's a series of exercises in the latest wisdom book, which is about emptiness, that actually um, kind of clarify. It's just a series of exercises you do. One is about the brain. One is about the self. And then the other is about the aggregates. and um, it's very clarifying. It's very clarifying. Uh, it would clarify the Heart Sutra for you. And um, actually, reading about the Abhidharma would clarify the Heart Sutra for you, too. Because it really doesn't come off as mys mystical after you look into these things. It comes off as very straightforward. Yeah. Well, uh, the, the things like the datus and the categories in the Abhidharma that you look at. In what way is the heart sutra straightforward? It's very straightforward. It, it, it lays out the philosophy 
just simply lays out the philosophy that's built into the dharma. It lays it out very clearly. Things to remember when you, you know, get to, into a sieve or something and you can't get yourself out of it. Um, things to remember, remember about yourself. I mean, even uh, down to science, when you actually sit down and look at things, you only see about that much of the room and the rest of it is a fantasy of your mind, which repeats things, which the Abhidharma talks about. So you, it's not magic, it's like science. So it's very clear. It needs to be repeated over and over again, but it's, it's very clear. You should read the Abhidharma, you should read one of the Abhidharma books. Yeah, because that'll clarify everything. Oh, sorry. Hi, Jen. Thank you for that reading. I'm a newbie to this um, teaching, uh, so I tend to like to paraphrase my understanding so that you, you or anyone else can tear it apart, and I know how much I know and how much I don't know. Uh, but it sounded like we're talking about, as humans, we're living in a world of forms, and that's an illusion. And kind of when they were coming together with uh, 5,000 people, that they're talking about a different reality that includes non-people entities. In that this idea of emptiness, um, I think you, you said it's not emptiness, it's like nothingness, but that our perception of who we are is inaccurate and that kind of like string theory. Um, we are not a separate entity from the world. We're connected. So this is what I got or what I understood. I don't know if that's correct or not. Um, so you're welcome to correct me. I don't... No, it's working. You can hear Okay. Um. No, that doesn't sound like it. I'm not gonna. Okay. No, no, not not about questions. Thank you, Linda. Um. So, string theory. What was the third? No, magic people. What there was something when you first started. Kind of talking about the world of forms. The world of. Forms. So we live in the world. We see right. things. We so think everything's solid, and it's one way, and. Um, but it's based on our perceptions, which are limited. And I would say it's both, right? We, we, I mean, right? We don't walk through walls, but also maybe eventually those walls do go away and there are gaps between them and it's like things are not what they seem to be. Maybe it's just that, right? It's, there is a real world that we live in, natural reality, but that's not being negated entirely, but it's that it also isn't the thing in itself in its entirety. I'm sure there are some senior students here who could put this more eloquently. Don't have <laughs> exist from their own side. We we create. We, yeah, things do not exist from their own side. So yeah, I'm gonna stop there. And it's noon and it's cupcake time. Unless there's some more questions. I I don't think I'm gonna start talking. It's okay. We ho we have them hostage here. We've got cupcakes. So I want to piggyback off of what Jules was saying earlier. Like when we started, when I started here, uh, one of the things that kept me here was just hearing the words that you know, form was nothing other than emptiness. And I, uh, I'm a philosopher, so I study a lot of different philosophies and like. That's one argument that 
everyone always argues about like what is mind and body and then what is this desk or what is this cushion is it just a representation or is there an actual physical object like so many people argue about how our perception is just uh like kind of like a imaginary dream you know like all that we see and all that we perceive is not entirely real because our perception is not able to grasp the realness and i think that's like what i understand is that like really like all this is like kind of a dream to a degree like as long as we don't like take anything too personally like this is whatever we make it to be or whatever we like not want it to be but you know Whatever is going to help everything keep spinning, basically. Hopefully that wasn't a ramble, but my names are a little bit shaky, so I'm not really uh, saying what I want to say. I, I appreciate I appreciate what you said. Yeah, I think that and starting to look at things in that way, I think takes us deeper into the Heart Sutra. And deeper into our understanding of how we're what, what we're doing here and how we're connected to each other. And, yeah, it's just further down the path. You don't have to apologize. I feel like I shouldn't say anything because I have studied so much less than everybody here. But one thing that I have learned here is about attachment and how attachment causes suffering. And that, that's something that is very helpful to me in my life. When I'm all upset because, you know, the parts of our house don't have electricity or something, um, I can just say, oh, why am I so attached to that idea? We have electricity in the back, you know. Um, and it works for a whole lot of things in my life. So I was, I'm wondering today if um, what the Heart Sutra is saying is that actually to believe you understand everything, including the teachings that, that to to insist that you actually have it you know own it you you're you're better off detaching thank you yeah detaching yourself from that notion that it's okay not to understand it's just like people that are really religious um there's a million things you can say to them and say, how could there be a God of blah, 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 you know? But they managed to uh, just say, no, there is a God. And, and in this case, it's more like, um, well, anyway, being the, I just like what you just said, the ability to detach yourself from the notion that you have to really understand, really, you know, like, be able to make a chart or something really understand it that's my idea I, I, I really appreciate that I, I I love that actually because I mean when we when we can get to that place of saying I don't know I'm not attached to it being any certain way what happens to our brain that when, when we do that I don't know to be not suddenly it's there's a lot of room around you it's very spacious and you're open to the experience and to, to some deeper level of insight as a result i think of of that beginner's mind or kind of non-attachment mind i think that's beautiful insight yeah thank you
Okay. Is it time to eat cake? Oh, dedication. And that, of course, it's time for more prayers. Dedication. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good, all powerful Chanmizik, Tenzin Gyatso. Please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Low song, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones. Merciful giver of restraint with profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators. Please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avinikoteshvara, great treasure of optical's compassion. Manjushu, master of flawless wisdom. Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Mars. Sankapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages. Wilson Drapa, I make requests at your holy feet. So we no announcement. So uh, next weekend, we're going to celebrate Lama Jampa's birthday at this time at 11 o'clock. And everybody's welcome to come. It's really fun. Um, some of us will, uh, a friend of ours, Clement, is going to sing a song. I don't know. It. It's an original song for Lama. And then some people might say a poem. I actually, for sure they will. And then um, there's other things I, I'm not... Sure, because they're they're being creative and not telling me because I'm a loose cannon, I've heard. <laughs> so that's true. My own family says the same, so it's at least I'm consistent. And then the, then on July 7th, we're having a celebration. It's an expressions event that's usually held on the last Friday, but this time it's being held on July 7th at the Dante Club. And there's um it's music, poetry, art. And um, if you want to know more about it, you can see um Matthew or Jules or myself or any member here, and we can tell you about it. And oh, most important, remember that cupcake she was talking about earlier? That's for real. We're celebrating, we're celebrating friendship and love by celebrating graduation of a very smart friends, uh, Jules and Elias. They graduated from college, something that's so extraordinary. So that's happening right now. So yeah. And Father's Day. Oh, yes. Whoever said that, Father's Day. All the fathers that are present here, all of us have fathers. So we're celebrating that amazing thing that's called a father. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, 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 u